we're setting up a series of what I'm calling town hall meetings, uh, which are um, allowing us to talk about some particular topics, but it's not just restricted to those topics as well, if you have other questions or comments. But the last one we did was talking about, um, it was uh, focused on membership and enhancing the value of IEEE membership. This one is on enabling active and effective sections. So I got a short, a short presentation I want to go through, just to kind of raise some things for, that could be potential discussion topics as we get into the majority of this the meeting here. So first of all, um, what's an active section? By the way, I wrote some series of blogs, short blogs on this, which I posted on LinkedIn, as well as on the, the tomcoughlin.com slash IEEE website, if you want to check that out. Uh, but IEEE sections exist to provide services and support for IEEE members living or working in that section. And uh, they may include putting on meetings, uh, professional, te uh, professional technology topics. Often those are put on for larger sections at least by their individual chapters. And the section may have events to help its members become senior members, support local IEEE student branches. Some sections have other things. They have social events of various sorts. Uh, they may support uh, uh, you know, getting uh, kids interested in technology, STEM sort of activities, or humanitarian activities of various sorts. And the number of things a section can do is affected by the size of the section, the number of volunteers available, the interests of the local members, and that may vary by geography, um, and the technical activities in the region where the section is located, as well as, you know, local cultural practices. And some sections are centered on a university because that's the big, the, the big technical a resource uh, in that section, and some are around companies or industry, and industry, for example, or a variety of industries, and some have a broader member base. Larger sections may have more volunteers interested in more things, and thus doing more things as well. So they might be able, to, they might be able to uh, do more activities. But on the other hand, even a small section could be very active. And participation in section events are the main way that most, I believe, most members, and especially non-members of the IEEE, interact with us the potential people potentially could be part of the IEEE or at least they're interested in what we do. And stronger active sections can increase the interest in being a member of the IEEE, I believe. So the danger of inactive sections are that um, this, first of all, this is the major way that most IEEE members interact with the IEEE. So if you don't have stuff going on, um, you're losing one of the things that many IEEE members find valuable. And many sections uh, struggle to find volunteers to fill key roles, even large sections, um, and to provide candidates to run for various offices. Some sections are also losing members, reducing the number of people who could be officers in IEEE groups. And some go dormant, and some chapters in a section can go dormant or eliminated if they don't meet for a long enough period of time. So some questions, and I'm gonna also ask these questions at the end just to get some discussion going. What can we do to help revitalize sections that need help? What can we do to increase industry interest and participation in local IEEE events? And how can we help sections meet their particular needs and interests better? I've got some ideas here, but I'm also very interested in what uh, other people might think as well. So there's some tools for IEEE section volunteers. Uh, uh, it, it's volunteers, of course, that make sections work and who also organize events and activities. And IEEE uh, helps its section volunteers by giving them tools to help with various activities, also allowing sections to carry on good technical organization activities that meet the needs of its members. VTools has a lot of these tools, uh, provides online tools for publicizing, getting registration for events, as well as reserving WebEx meetings, for example. There are tools available for posting locally created content, such as recorded section uh, chapter technical meetings, uh, which actually with uh, a couple of other folks, uh, we had a Nick initiative to, uh, to make that possible a few years ago. And there actually is an IEEE TV channel where you can upload your recordings of a, a volunteer created event, such as local chapter meetings. IEEE also provides financial services for its sections and, and chapters. Uh, IEEE provides various training tools. Uh, there's a lot of these things located at the Center for Leadership Excellence, uh, where you can find volunteer job descriptions for a lot of IEEE roles, including those at the section and chapter level. The webpage also contains information about the VOLT program, which is a volunteer uh, leadership training program uh, for, uh, it, where you can learn about the broader IEEE uh, for, and it's essentially for uh, already established IEEE leaders to give them a bigger perspective of what the IEEE is um, and perhaps to uh, interest them in, in further leadership roles. In many regions and sections have their own training programs that they carry out to let new volunteers learn how to do things in their local IEEE section. For instance, our Santa Clara Valley section 
and um, also sometimes uh, in combination with the Oakland East Bay and the San Francisco section have had uh, volunteer training events that they would do on an annual basis. And there are other sections that do that kind of thing as well. So there's some things that have come up uh, that I think could have enormous value for sections. One of this idea of IEEE section local groups. And um, it's something that has been before MGA, which has approved it. They're trying to get technical IEEE technical activities to get behind this. There's now some uh, pilot uh, work going on this, but it's a, the idea this is a flexible, agile IEEE organizational unit whose purpose is bringing together members and non-members of similar interests, uh, providing, which would provide an environment where IEEE is relevant to the people, uh, whether members or non-members in a particular, a particular section. It might coordinate with local industry, university or government groups and or technical or things that are technically relevant um, and discover and, but it's not necessarily a technical area that's tied into any particular existing IEEE society or council. It could also uh, discover and explore new trends with geographic or technical relevance and increase local engagement and therefore a connection across the IEEE, a way I think of creating even more active and engaged sections. So there's many IEEE local groups that exist right now, though they don't have access to the tools that this, this uh, initiative would have. Uh, they're composed of industry, early career, mid-career professionals, community members. For instance, in the Santa Clara Valley section, we have a sustainability, a technology history, an entrepreneur, and a blockchain local group, for example. So um, the, prob the problem with these groups right now is they, are, they, they don't have access to VTools, for instance. They aren't tracked and recognized by the larger IEEE. Um, they may not be well connect, they may or may not be well connected with other IEEE engagement opportunities, especially outside of their section. And IEEE doesn't know, big IEEE doesn't know these things are even going on. So they can't leverage that, for instance, to help IEEE get more and more engaged in these emerging areas. So uh, the idea here is that we can create a grassroots effort to create new types of activities that IEEE can be involved in, which are relevant to that, to that local area. So these groups have access to many of the features of VTools, such as posting meetings. Uh, the idea, as it's had been presented, uh, would need approval from the local, local section chair, but they can form by only a few members. I think it's like two members and three people total, rather than 12 members required to form a new society or council chapter. And they can include non-members as well as members. They can also be disbanded quickly. So this is like ad hoc groups that serve as long as they're useful. Um, and they won't have a definite connection to existing societies or councils and IEEE technical activities, although those groups may have an interest in these things. And having them be, you know, tied in to VTools will allow them to track and find out what, they're, what these groups are, are doing. This approach might be used for creating local groups on an emerging technology. For instance, there are 40 blockchain local groups all over the world right now. Or they can serve as a local IEEE group in a company or a government facility, for example. Um, the idea is to generate the rapid formation of groups at the local level who can meet the needs of section members and thus increase engagement with the IEEE at the local level. Um, so I think that's an example of something that if we could, if uh, we can get the broader IEEE to agree that this that we should be doing this, um, there's already existing groups, but they don't have access to the tools. IEEE really, the bigger IEEE doesn't really know what they're doing. But we need to create, I think, means by which grassroots groups can be enabled. Um, can communicate and, and be uh, larger, other parts of IEEE can be aware of what they're doing and build on it. So another thing I think is really important, especially in sections, is to create a sense of community. If we want people to look at IEEE as their professional home, like I think we want to, we need to make them feel like they're part of a community. One way to do this is to help local members become senior members. And I talk, we talked uh, about this a fair amount at, at a, in our last town hall meeting. Another way is for local section volunteers to show up on a local campus to, uh, to talk when we can again, physically or virtually and interact with student members so that they know that IEEE is more than a student club so that they look at that as some and maybe talk to them even about the value of IEEE once you graduate. Um, I, we also should be involved, I think, in, in supporting STEM or humanitarian activities and maybe other things that are particular to a particular geography or culture. Uh, to demonstrate that IEEE sections are a community. Um, examples, uh, here's an example of the value of an IEEE local community, a way of sort of establishing that. When I was director of IEEE Region 6, um, I worked with IEEE membership to get volunteers at IEEE sections in Region 6 to uh, uh, basically to find volunteers in sections who would call or email a list of 10 people each 
who hadn't renewed their membership. So this list of 10 non-renewing members from the section was accompanied by a script. So it gives you a jump off point for talking to people about why they didn't renew, what we could have done differently. We wasn't really a pitch to bring them back in membership unless they add, they said, gosh, I, you know, I didn't know I wasn't a member anymore or something like that. Then you help them. But, but it was basically to find out what they were thinking about and what we could have done differently to have kept them as a member. And then we had a link to a Google document where people could upload their notes on what they found out during their contacts. And we learned a lot of really interesting things about this. And some of the stuff we learned in doing this was, for instance, I went through two of these lists myself in the Santa Clara Valley section. And about 40% of the people I spoke with said they had forgot or thought someone else had renewed for them. And what we found um, overall in the region was the time that we did this, the year that we did this, we had about a 2% increase in renewals and regions, renewals of people who had been members that renewed their members as a result of this work. So it did work. And having somebody, I think, from your local section contact you to talk about why you didn't renew your membership. And by the way, Big Eye Tripoli sends out a message, but this is local. This is someone who lives in your, in your area. Um, I think makes an impression on people and demonstrates that we are a community that cares about its members. We care if you... If you're not a member, at least we'd like to understand why, why you didn't renew. So that leads to me to are some questions that we can talk about today. And maybe there's other things as well, but what can we do to revitalize sections that need help? What can we do to increase industry interest and participation in local IEEE events? How can we help sections meet their particular needs and interests better? And with that, I'm going to quit sharing um, so I can actually see what people, what questions people may have. And if you've got a question, uh, right now, and I see there's some questions here. I used to bring the student sections any meals we had left over from uh, uh, from events. That, that's a great idea. You know, students are always hungry; they're always looking for something to eat. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you bring them food, you win their hearts. <laughs> so I think it's a great idea. There is a uh, a Q and A question. This is from Paul Wesley, who is involved in creating some local groups. Right. Um, I talk about as though it's a future thing, but the board approved it last November. Um, the MGA board approved it. There was a resistance um, I technical activities, technical activities, uh, I don't I, I don't believe has has approved it yet. There now is a what they approved was doing a pilot program of some um, uh, some local groups and then go back and talk to uh, technical activities, the technical activities board to see if they're okay with going ahead with this. I think that's the status. Who could participate in the pilot? Well, Paul, as you know, I was trying to get the local Santa Clara Valley Sustainability Group uh, to be one of the pilot people, and they were interested in doing it, but I never heard back, so we never made that connection. So uh, I'm hoping they have some good pilot uh, cases. That would, would have been a good one if we could have, if, uh, if, the, if the folks would have, uh, would have responded. Brendan, ah, so uh, if uh, now we have a formal local group category, what should be done for IEEE to capture and disseminate best practices? Um, like I say, I don't think it's generally available to sections yet, although they are looking, they, they may still be looking for sections that could participate in the pilot program. And um, uh, uh, I think the idea of how you do this, bet, do a better job of this is a great idea. I think, um, uh, you know, we, we should get a hold of sections that are already doing this um, find out how they do it, you know, what the most of the methods are. And then from the pilot program, presumably they'll get some, uh, some input from them as well. But they're already, like I say, you know, there's already in some large sections like Santa Clara Valley, there's already local groups that have been around, some of them for quite some years. I'm currently the chair of a technical history um, chapter, which is basically an ad hoc group in the Santa Clara Valley section. It's been around since um, I think 2011 or two, 2011, 2012, uh, maybe. And um, so there's some of these things. And then there's a sustainability group that actually was a photovoltaic group that Paul was involved in a while back that uh, was also uh, even older than that one. Got another question here. Tom, Tom, can yeah. I ask you one other question there? Yeah, on, sure, on, the, yeah. uh, on these sort of ad hoc groups, do you think there are ways to, you know, make use of our greater virtual meeting capability now that we have? And much more familiarity there to help to keep these going, you know, and to um, make, make plans, you know, use, the, use these groups for whatever their purpose is, if it's planning an event or planning a, a conference or something like that. Can we, I can think, we you know, leverage now, it that way? Yeah, now that people have a lot more familiarity with doing remotely interacting in meetings, um, 
I think it'd be a, a great resource to be more more generally used, even when we can actually have physical meetings. Sometimes people have difficulty getting to a meeting if they have the option, and if we uh, create the capability, even when you have a physical meeting, if people are joined virtually, that that would be a great resource. Allow more people to be interacting, um, especially like in very large areas where it can be quite a an issue to drive somewhere, for example. So I think it's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, I think it can certainly create more participation. And I mean, and ultimately, that's kind of what it's all about is uh, getting greater participation in these activities then. Okay, so, uh, okay, here's a comment. Um, let's see, uh, I have my office in Palo Alto. I have lived in Fremont for 42 years. The Oakland East Bay section greatly needs help in generating interest in East Bay meetings. All the meetings I go to around the peninsula. Um, yeah, uh, I, you know, and by the way, there is for people in uh, the Silicon Valley area and the three sections around here, um, there is something called the E-Grid, which lists uh, meetings that whether in Oakland East Bay, San Francisco, or the Santa Clara Valley section. So there's a way to find out about uh, about uh, meetings, and um, uh, you know that's one of one of the res uh, resources that we have. For instance, here, there's other cities that have things like that as well. Boston has the Reflector, for example. Um, but the, uh, I think those are good resources for letting people know about other meetings. Um, but I think it's, uh, uh, you know, use, uh, in terms of getting the word out about meetings, of course, there's uh, e-notices, you know, that a section can use to let people know about events going on. E-grid in the case of, for instance, uh, a large um, area like, uh, like the Bay Areas, you know, we have that as another resource. Um, and there's some good folks over in the Oakland East Bay section, you know, so um, I really, I, I, and they have, actually Oakland East Bay section has some chapters that don't exist in Santa Clara Valley section, for instance. I think it was a nuclear power or nuclear uh, plasma physics group there that we don't have, for instance, Santa Clara Valley, but because of Lawrence Livermore, they do have an Oakland East Bay. So they have some unique, um, which I hope is still active and they have meetings, but they have some unique uh, things that we don't have here in Santa Clara Valley. Uh, let's see, Paul Wesson, can we get the approved board of, uh, board, uh, board of Governors motion and its details to help us understand what might be included in, uh, in these groups? Yes, we can. Um, and I think that's, I think we, I think we get easy access on that, uh, Paul. So we, uh, glad to look into that and see if we can, uh, we can dig that up. The, the question I have is about, uh, large sections, geographically large sections, Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I ask if this has come up in conversations I've had with people who live in sections that include an entire country, right. but that have, in some cases, a total membership headcount that is perhaps comparable to or less than the Silicon Valley or the um, Santa Clara Valley. Mm -hmm. So we could talk about a little bit that uh, a little bit about that now, uh, but it might be something to come back to in conversations directly with members from those sections. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. Uh, but, uh, Paul brings up something interesting uh, here. I'm noticing uh, he's saying, uh, I propose we share uh, many, most of our virtual chapter meetings across region six sections, but he said some, uh, but many sections push back. Um, I think they wanted to promote only their own, own local chapters. How about opening a whole list of upcoming chapter webinars to all members to give them greater value uh, that a section can provide by itself. Actually, I think the Region 6 website has access to all the meetings that are on VTools that you can access through, re you know, that are on Region 6, you can access through that website. So I think there is ways you can find that out. Um, and I know, Paul, that you do a good job yourself of sending out to your, your email list a uh, list of, of things going on in many, many sections that you find of interest. So I think those are, that's a, a great idea. I think, um, you know, uh, being able to, uh, especially with everything virtual, being able to um, shop around for things that look of interest um, is, is very useful and interesting. And, you know, uh, for instance, we did an S uh, society, SSIT chapter we started last year in, in Santa Clara Valley. And we uh, did one in combination with the UK and Ireland sections. So we had people, a bunch of people from Europe, as well as from uh, Santa Clara Valley and, and many other places that joined in some of these sessions ends up being hundreds of people, you know, that I've noticed, I've noticed even just local chapter meetings can, can be huge if the topic is, uh, is engaging. 
I think the idea of creating greater resources for finding these events is good. VTools gives that to you. I think Region 6 has a capability of that. Paul, if you got some other ideas of things we could do, I'd uh, be glad to hear about those. How about IEEE TV? Does that provide some capability of this sort? IEEE TV provides, um, uh, for instance, uh, you can have access to recorded meetings that people post up there. And that is something, again, you know, we've had an initiative we tried to get going to do that. There actually is an IEEE channel for uploading content um, onto IEEE TV on that channel. So that would be a way of being able to share. Or the idea we had when we actually did the initiative was, say, a smaller section that has a hard time getting speakers, or especially really interesting speakers, then essentially borrow a speaker from a larger section that had a lot more, a lot more things going on and, and use that basically as their talk for their chapter, for their section meeting. So mm -hmm. section or chapter meeting. So um, I think those are ways we can do that. Uh, so Mike Andrews has a question here. Some years ago, Region 6 invested video recording systems for all sections. This is part of that whole uh, new initiatives committee thing we were talking about. To promote hybrid meetings, would IEEE make a similar investment in quality microphones and possibly speakers? And I assume the speakers are not humans but I'm not sure if. Uh, no, he mean, he means the the microphones and uh, and, and the know, speakers audio like for audio lighting, yeah. all all the tools that you need for a good broadcast camera potentially. Yeah, I think that the uh, you know that could be an interesting um, uh, an interesting approach though. Uh, you know, microphone microphones you can use for remote meetings. Um, I think you know it's not a huge investment to to do things like that and to give that kind of capabilities. I think it actually could be a very good and interesting initiative. Okay, comment here. Is that something you would support, Tom? I would support As something. President? Yes, yes, I would support doing something like that. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. It's always Paul. good to know where your, your heart is. Yes. Uh, I, uh, Paul said he posts his local webinars on IEEE TV. Yay, Paul. Yeah. Um, and we need, uh, Paul says we need a push system, not a, a new pull system uh, like the R6 website from VTools. Okay, if you got some ideas, now we could do that. Love to hear those, Paul. Yeah, IEEE T, uh, has three and a half employees plus one volunteer who has access to the internals of their servers, channels, etc. Oh, that one person is him. <laughs> okay. Ah, wow. All right, so Paul Wessling is our man for all knowledge uh, related IEEE to IEEE TV. TV. Yes. Great, Paul. We're, we're going to be talking to you more then. <laughs> would, would you like to join the Tom Coughlin for President-Elect campaign? <laughs> you would be a very helpful person on that. He uh, says he's already a member. There you okay. go. Good to know. <laughs> Something that I see here, Silicon Valley, our Santa Clara Valley section, mm -hmm. this is the largest IEEE section in the world. We have, what, well over 30 chapter societies, that kind of thing, that are represented here. Some affiliate groups that are very active, like our IEEE Consultants Network uh, is very active here. We have a lot of activity here in this area, and, and I think especially with the advent of virtual meetings and hybrid meetings once we start having in-person meetings again, I, I think as Paul and others have brought up, we should definitely be able to leverage this into other sections that are not having success in getting speakers. I mean, it is a big job to get speakers and arrange meetings. Well, and, and here's the other thing. There are um, some prohibitions against uh, multiple uh, so I don't know if there's any, in terms of the um, R31s or, you know, the equivalent, right? The L31s, the equivalent. 31s, yeah. I don't think that there's anything about multiple sections not being able to uh, claim a meeting that they both, you know, co-sponsor and put on, you know? I, I, I don't know about multiple sections. I mean, yes, uh, and, and for those um, coming from outside IEEE, you know, th this is a, a mechanism that IEEE uses to basically document or record that a meeting took place, what chapter sponsored it, how many attended, that kind of thing. And there's a, there's a financial aspect at the end of the year called a rebate that goes back to chapters that actively sponsor meetings. Here in Santa Clara Valley, um, our local section has set up some guidelines and rules that an active chapter or society needs to have at least two technical meetings per year not too big of a of a, of a lift our, our consultants network tends to have about 10 per year 
um, plus other things. So the, these all get put put in our, our local section also put in a kind of a guideline that um, two chap you, you can co-sponsor meetings, but you can't both get get for uh, credit for it for L31. Again, I would say that's not a big deal. That, that's sort of a bookkeeping thing. It has a, a small benefit on your financial rebate, but I think the most important part is to actually have the meetings and, you know, join together to have them. I mean, yeah. what, what do you think, Tom? Is that well, that that was a rule made up by the Santa by the Santa Clara Valley right. section, right? Right. So Just I don't think do there's any thing. prohibition against uh, doing it between sections. That's I mean, what I'm saying. Other sections may have their own rules, right? Or a section, uh, another section could take a recording of of an of uh, a presentation made somewhere else, and use that for their meeting. You know, you know, if if they have a hard time getting speakers, you know, it's just more tools to help sections remain active to remain. You know, relevant to their communities to bring in good speakers, even if they, and, and by the way, even even getting, bringing in live speakers with a high with a uh, a remote event is a lot easier than it used to be. Oh, you know, absolutely. Because people don't have to travel, you don't have to pay for them absolutely. to travel. Yeah. And, so. and, and Paul, re, go, go hit hit Paul's comment there. The the second part about um, you know the co co sponsoring. I think he's exactly right. Yeah, uh, it's only uh, the financial aspect L31 is only for the initial chapter that sets up the event, but the organizational way well, he's saying there's greater value in co-sponsorship anyway, is that the, the organizational aspects of co-sponsorship are strong. Um, you're keeping active, you're serving members, you're supplementing their own meetings, and you're also send, sending out notices and information about this event to a broader audience, therefore potentially increase in the participation, you know, and the engagement. And by the way, uh, since I'm there, Paul S. also says he has a, a short list of instructions on how to edit WebEx Zoom uh, using Adobe Premiere and optimizing it for uploading to IEEE TV or YouTube. So uh, that's a resource that Paul has available for helping, uh, helping chapter uh, video editors. And he's held training sessions before. And then, uh, and I think you spoke about this already, Daniel, but you mentioned something about, uh, you know, something like Santa Clara Valley section, it's a lot of people in a smaller geographic area, but the very large sections, um, uh, what are their challenges? And uh, I think one of the challenges might be, um, you know, how do you ever have a meeting? You know, and I think that is an area where, you know, doing these virtual events, um, assuming people have connectivity, right, which you may not in some areas, but assuming you have connectivity that you can actually uh, bring together people from, you know, uh, a broad area, like in some of these, uh, some of these uh, very large geographic sections. So yeah, I was at a section meeting that took place just before the a few months before the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. and this was in a, a large metropolitan area where people had to fly in or come in by bus or van uh, from locations many hundreds of kilometers away, and in some cases, officers who were serving together in that section uh, lived hundreds of kilometers apart from each other. And in addition to these uh, distance related challenges, they had exchange rate challenges where money that they received from Piscataway uh, had to get converted to local currency to reimburse people for expenses from earlier in the year. But because of the runaway inflation, by the time they converted it back, um, it wasn't worth more than you know two or three nickels. So that's where I'm, I'm really interested, at, not just tonight, but in other meetings like this, when we start connecting to people in some of those other sections uh, to learn about some of the, the challenges that they face that will be uh, significantly different than some of the uh, big issues that we face here. And I do see somebody from Oakland East Bay on here as well as I think a couple of uh, friends from Region 9. Yeah. Exactly. What do you think, um, I, Tom, I guess I'll, I'll throw out another one here. You know, a lot of times our activities, it seems like, and, and cooperation kind of goes with chapters that are the same, like consumer electronics in our section versus other sections may collaborate. Mm -hmm. But I view, and uh, we have several of our, we have a, a couple of our ASME colleagues that are on, you know, as you and I have discussed a lot, I think there is tremendous need to cooperate and collaborate and have events across different societies, 
but even within IEEE. Oh, I think consumer so. electronics, vehicular technology, you know, various things like this have so many common interests. How can we bring that together a little more? Um, so, um, well, part of it is just people getting to know each other and, and working together, especially in the section, right? If you want to focus on the section in particular, is uh, people being aware of other people's meetings. If there's part of that meeting that make that has an interest in their section, asking, can I be a co-sponsor? Can I work with you on this? Can I help spread the word at least about this? Um, yeah. You know, are things that you could do. Uh, there may be more sophisticated things we could do at a, at a bigger level, which is uh, especially for small sections that have a hard time finding, uh, uh, finding speakers, uh, creating a more broad, especially if it's remote, you know, uh, speaker bureau, available people who could talk about topics and making that available for those sections to help them remain active. Um, the other is, of course, that using those uh, section record meeting recordings and playing those locally. Um, I think those are ideas of ways that we could, uh, you know, uh, create greater value for those sections to engage their, in their members, even though they're they're a small section. And in a sense, you know, greater familiarity with these remote tools like this are making it easier for us to do that. So I think that having gone through this last year and the experiences we've got, we've, you know, um, Trends that have been happening in general, you know, for uh, uh, digital transformation have been accelerated. And that includes things like how do we have, you know, doing remote meetings and people becoming more comfortable with, uh, with these tools. And I think that that could, you know, if we do this right, that benefits us for IEEE, both at the local section level, potentially also, I think, at the bigger conference level, you know, is that you could potentially get a lot more people engaged in an event you know, if some of them can be remote, you know, so even if you can do a physical event, having a hybrid component, I think it's going to be a lot more of that. Um, and I think uh, it, it, you know, the potential is there is that you have uh, uh, a small um, uh, section, you know, if you create, if they looked around, they could borrow essentially talks, resources, or speakers from other sections, you know, they could be extraordinarily active. You know, um, it made tools to make that easy to use. And even for, you know, our uh, section for chapters and big sections, sometimes they have a hard time finding speakers. So if we created like international speaker bureaus, you know, uh, in some of these you got, you know, through distinguished lectures in some societies, but maybe even going beyond that, the official distinguished lectures, like experts who could say, I could sign up for this thing and I, I can talk about this topic, yeah. you know, and, you know, here's things I can talk about, you know, let me know if you're interested. I think there are things we could do like we could we, we, we could make better tools, you know, make uh, actually I triple to make an investment in our sections like Mike was uh, was asking and you were asking about uh, Kim, you know, microphones that uh, good microphones for doing or and cameras for doing uh, remote uh, remote meetings, for example. I'm, I'm going to try something a little bit different here and let's see if this works along this theme of what we were just talking about. As I said, two, two of my, uh, me being a mechanical engineer, you know, I like other mechanical engineers. So I'm going to ask uh, Elise Englehart and Met Nosen, uh, who are both uh, friends from ASME, what do you think about how we can cross pollinate some of these activities, you know, get some of these things going across sections? Do you, do you have um, comments or thoughts or ideas you want to throw in? So I unmuted both of you. So you're, you're on now. <laughs> so um, I'll go first, uh, Elise. Uh, uh, you know, I, I work in an environment where we have electrical engineers and mechanical engineers working together. Uh, sometimes we don't speak the same language, but uh, it, you know that create that has its own challenges. But um, uh, the the world is becoming more and more multidisciplinary for us especially in Silicon Valley here, where we have, we are looking into anything from signal integrity to, uh, you know, the heat generated with the uh, uh, electromagnetic waves and uh, the, that causes thermal expansion and that causes thermal stresses, this, that. So uh, there's a greater need for this multidisciplinary uh, activity. Um, that's at least that's what I'm experiencing in my workplace. So uh, I'd like to see more of those type of events. 
I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, th this is something that I, I've brought up um, a number of times and, you know, with some success, we've gotten some things going from multiple chapters, multiple societies. Sometimes we run into some, um, I don't know if I would say pushback necessarily, but just organizational or administrative deals. Like I, I tried to get ASME to publicize a meeting that involved um, certain uh, vehicle characteristics. And they said, well, if we're not a co-sponsor, we can't publicize it. And I said, well, do you want to be a co-sponsor? <laughs> well, we don't have time to be a co-sponsor. That takes multiple signatures and running up the flagpole. So the bottom line is it's all part. Yeah. But I think this can be done with enough advanced time. This, can, this kind of thing can be done. And I guess we just have to start earlier and um, you know work, work it through to make it happen and in some cases do it more informally you know just not not rely on the other publicity rely on um, friends and colleagues to publicize so um, I thought... Elise, any um, or Tom you no, no go ahead you finish I, I was just going to ask uh, Elise if uh, she had mm -hmm. thoughts on this regard Elise and Metten have both been chairs of the Santa Clara Valley section for ASME in the past past. Uh, Metten is an ASME fellow, so they've both been very involved in the group. So Lisa, um, if you, I'm hi, can you, can you hear me? Spot, yes, we yes, can. We can hear okay. you. So, sorry, I stepped away for a moment. The, um, the question was what, what to do to cross-pollinate societies between different societies? That, that, that's, that's one thing, just generally how to promote more um, interactivity or collaboration on things that should be of interest to everyone it shouldn't be just an electrical engineering or just a mechanical engineering thing but it's a multidisciplinary thing that involves all of the above right um well i that was one reason i had started the meetup group and um i, I have a meetup group called the business of engineering meetup that i still have um although hasn't been very active for a year but um i just think we need uh, the IEEE, uh, you know, the grid is great, but um, uh, people that aren't IEEE don't necessarily get it. Uh, I, I do get it, but... Um, they, they, they can. I mean, they just need to, um, you know, subscribe. But, um, yeah, yeah, they're very free to send it out to everyone who subscribes. And it's on the website. Right. right. So I'm always looking for new places to um, promote events that, um, uh, that different... Uh, different types of engineers would see um, and um, and it is hard to get things on the, the grid of course if you're not on there often has to be paid if you're not at IEEE section but um, I think there, there's many cases where we get real value from uh, you know uh, interacting and doing things together with other with other engineering organizations especially at the local level I think the you know um, I think there's uh, enormous value that you can get through those kind of interactions um, and maybe even some, you know, uh, cross membership, you know, that people yeah. find that there's great enough interest in things. I, I'm um, glad at least mentioned the e-grid because that is really an important one that I think goes into value, increased value of, for members, increased activity for sections. For any who are not familiar with it, um, this is put together here in the the Bay Area region, so it's Santa Clara Valley, Oakland, East Bay, San Francisco, egrid, E-G-R-I-D dot biz, I believe is the website. You can subscribe and you'll get a PDF by email two times per month. Uh, this shows a short synopsis of all the upcoming scheduled chapter events and a link to get for more information to go from them. Um, do you think, for example, that we could publicize, you know, joint events that we're holding with ASME or with a Society of Automotive Engineers or others. We should well, be able to publicize those through the E-Grid, right? Well, you have to, you know, I'm not going to tread on, uh, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area Council or the sections. Uh, I understand, but but I'm just saying it's, it seems like it would be a good thing to do, not, not I, a negative thing I think thing if, if you have something that's sponsored by... Um, you know, local, for instance, a local IEEE chapter and, you know, ASME, for instance, I, I would assume, I assume that, that that could uh, go into the e-grid, you know, yeah. so things like da that. Daniel, Daniel Lotus post, posted the URL for it that, that you get to through the IEEE link. And then, like I said, the egrid.biz, I believe, is also 
uh, correct. So, so, so there's another idea I'd like to bring up that I think uh, also can have value for local sections. Um, this maybe isn't particularly in large geographic areas, but it's the idea of uh, IEEE participating in trade shows. Yeah. And, you know, in the various leadership positions I've had in IEEE, I've tried to get us engaged in these, you know, and I've been involved in some IEEE engagements in trade shows like the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, Design Con, um, Flash Memory Summit, and and sometimes there's uh, chapters or even sections that might get involved in some in some of these activities. But I think it's a way of reaching out. And if we did it right, reaching out to a broader engineering community to raise awareness of IEEE of what we do and maybe even be able to recruit more members or at least show our engagement in the local industry. And I just I think uh, sometimes, um, you know, you get so focused on uh, the folks that are currently engaged in IEEE. If we bring programs active, oh, semi, Semicon, again, in the, in the Bay Area, here's another one that we've had some interact. IEEE, in some groups I've been connected with IEEE have had interactions with them. So I think it's another very important um, venue where you have such events, and again, it's probably larger urban areas, is to engage in, in uh, those technical trade shows and other activities and show a presence of the IEEE there. Yeah, eager is founded by Paul Whistling. That's true. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Paul should get credit for that. Very, yep. very useful publication. And oh, and, and he points out that uh, uh, their EPS chapter is setting up a joint relationship with the Materials Research Society student chapter at Stanford. Interesting. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Brendan brings up something here. Is uh, and we mentioned it earlier, but many IEEE societies have speaker lists like these distinguished lectures. And sometimes they'll cover their travel costs, especially for student chapters. Um, it's true, but a lot of times you can only access that through the society. And what I'm thinking is, and maybe it could include those people, but include other folks as well, is creating, could we create, can we break down the silos to some extent, you know, uh, in terms of uh, where it's appropriate, of course, you know, a local chapter should bring in someone, you know, who's being sponsored by that society, right? Especially if they're paying for it, that, that should work. But can we create something that maybe includes these kind of speakers, but includes other folks as well, and something that's more universally available to sections? You know, for instance, if they don't have a chapter, can they can they find a, on a particular topic? Can they find speakers on that topic, especially if it's virtual, because costs are a lot less. And actually, you know, and if it, even if it was someone who's sponsored by a society, but it's a virtual event, it actually at least raises a better, more awareness that the that the society is around, and perhaps it could even help. To create, um, if there's uh, enough people in the section who are interested in that, to create a new a new chapter. Yeah, and, but and I, as it was mentioned before, you know, besides attendance at the time of an event, whether it's virtual or in person, you know, as as we're now uh, pretty pretty well able to record virtual events and make you you know that provides uh, material for later that can also be. Uh, be useful to people like consultants network posts Jeff Sapphire posts these on our events page so past events will generally have both PDF slides and they will have video recordings yeah yeah uh, there, there are there are a lot of uh, chapters um, affinity groups and chapters that do record and and many of them post on their own websites some of them will do the IEEE treaty posting others just post their own websites you know which you have to know they're there to find them Right. Uh, but there are, you know, if you go through IEEE, there's a lot of resources, but it's finding these things and knowing they exist. And that's been one of the biggest it's frustrations. To, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. something to keep in mind. Uh, I've, I've been on a couple of calls with um, chapters in different places of India and in a couple of uh, locations in Africa. And bandwidth that we take for granted here is not always available to all all of our members in some of these locations. Right. So um, currently, post pandemic, bandwidths have increased and platforms such as Zoom and WebEx have become um, better equipped and people are more familiar with them. However, um, that does not really uh, is, is not really a benefit that impacts all of our IEEE members worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the US, I can recall helping somebody start a magnetic society chapter, I think it was in South Dakota, because within their region, uh, 
most of the, the the talks were taking place in the Twin Cities, and that was how far they had to go to attend a live meeting. Uh, back then, the University of Minnesota was way ahead of its time. It was already broadcasting on some kind of TV system. Mm -hmm. But what I heard from, from folks in, in very large sections, such as some of those in Brazil and uh, Argentina, uh, in entire countries in South America, is that the activities wind up focused near the cities where the headquarters are located. And again, unless you have bandwidth for, for communicating, and that means that, that the individual members need to have this at home or in their offices, that still doesn't quite cut it. So uh, I'm not offering any solutions right now. I'm just reminding folks that the challenges that we face in the Bay Area or Oakland East Bay uh, are not going to be uh, the same as what people are, are are facing in some of these other ones. And as, as time goes by, we'll figure it out. But but we care and, and we're determined to to uh, <laughs> hear about and address needs there. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, maybe things like Starlink or uh, systems like that give more distributed, uh, you know, satellite based communication worldwide will help. Uh, but it's uh, uh, you're speaking of that I think that's an important initiative that IEEE should be behind is how do we get bandwidth available to those that don't have it now because um, you can't function in today's society and do the kind of things that that uh, you know that, that are becoming common without bandwidth so um, it's extremely important uh, it is one of those things that I think I triple should be behind efforts to uh, increase bandwidth availability and connectivity between people you know I think um, you know, this bandwidth allows us to entertain each other, to uh, communicate with each other, and hopefully for people to better understand each other, you know, because they can see, they can get some context of people, you know, from where they're from. And uh, maybe that'll help us to be better people and to live, uh, uh, to live more peaceably with each other. Kind of hoping to hear uh, uh, some people in the town hall talking about um, getting ideas for getting more volunteers involved in running local groups um i'm out here in the chicago section actually i'm really in the rock river valley section but um because i'm in the consultants network we we're a joint affinity group between the two sections and um so I, I get involved with both and um it seems like the, the there's a you know a, a pattern that it is really hard to find additional volunteers and we we keep kind of relying on the same people to step forward uh, for time and time again. Yeah. And, and so succession planning for, for future uh, officers to, to, to pick up positions down the road and, and even just, just to fill all the slots that we have in, in the different groups. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge. And, and I was kind of surprised that I wasn't hearing much about that in tonight's talk. Um, and, but I, 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 I have to think we're not we're not the only only ones experiencing this. No, uh, that's no, it's that's, a universal. That's the top top of our frequently asked questions, uh, and we have entire entire sessions at our annual training events uh, regarding that. And we remind people that the plan for succession is their biggest chore for the year. Yeah. Uh, well, and so maybe there's so let's, let's think about it. are there some things we might be able to do about that? For example, what you know, it's really interesting, you know, because I triple members, many of them are paid pretty well. But um, if you offer somebody some kind of a deal where they can save some money, uh, it's actually kind of attractive to these people, you know, to us. So what if you got we're very hmm. pragmatic. What if you got <laughs> some credit for being an IEEE volunteer? Right, that you could use apply towards something else in IEEE, or maybe even reduce the price of your membership. Yeah, right, yeah. so you know, you know, there's more way. In in a sense, what it is, it's finding more ways to engage with people and get them interested. You know, in being volunteers. You know, it recognition is one thing, and I think it's important that we recognize people that are volunteers. Yep. We honor yep. them. You know, but I think it's also uh, are there new ways that we can encourage more people to become volunteers give them something out, you know, that they get out of it by doing it. Um, because I, I think being a volunteer, you know, helps you a lot in your career and nice. it developing skills, you know, especially working with other people. I mean, if you've got other people that you're working with, you have a leadership position, they aren't getting paid. If you can get right. them. Stuff, <laughs> right. Right. That's pretty good experience, I think. You know? So, so well, and, and I, I was, I was going to kind of amplify on that same point too. 
you know, a lot of times getting volunteers, like let's say you have a couple of people that they're the speaker committee and they're to line up speakers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can seem like a huge job and sometimes it is a big job, but you know, if you can, if you can recognize the benefit that in finding a speaker, you get to reach out and talk to someone and make a contact that you might not have before. It's actually a ready-made excuse for calling some very big person uh, to invite to meet. them yeah. to be a speaker. It's <laughs> yeah. actually an opportunity. And, you know, for consultants, we love opportunities, you know, right. so uh, re reaching out to someone in that regard um, for instance, uh, th this past week, uh, the electric uh, vehicle group uh, here in Silicon Valley organized a tour of Lightning Motorcycles. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to meet the CEO there uh, of Lightning Motorcycles. I'm definitely reaching out to him to get him to try to um, be, be a speaker for some of our groups. Um, sure. This is one that's a clear electrical, mechanical vehicle, everything mm -hmm. uh, kind of deal here. Uh, batteries, it's got, mm -hmm. it's got it all. By um, the way, uh, it, Brendan points yeah. out, by the way, that there is an IEEE, there's a volunteering site. And I just looked it up and I posted it on the chat. There's a volunteering oh, okay. portal. So I don't know if there's anything to prevent you getting, you're in Rock, uh, you know, uh, you're Chicago and Rockport, but could you, well, I guess you have to have officers have to be from those two sections, but maybe it might be a way of, uh, you know, maybe there's people from your sections that are putting themselves as volunteering platforms. So, yeah. Yeah. And, is, and, and I was going to say, I mean, making things that make it more active, like collaborating. I mean, I'm active, Tom's active, uh, Daniel, Jeff Sapphire, we're all active in the consultants network here. You mentioned that for your end, you know, we mm -hmm. can definitely collaborate on some things that maybe, you know, make uh, make joining some of your meetings more interesting uh, or mm -hmm. provide some some suggestions for speakers that you, you might follow also. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of ways that can improve it to, to actually hold the office. Yeah, you need to be in the section, but to volunteer, you could be anywhere, right? Uh, yes. That doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, you could be on a program committee and be in Afghanistan, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, by the way, I noticed that uh, in addition to people being able to volunteer, there's people looking for volunteers. If you're an IEEE member, right, then you can, uh, there's a place you can do that as well. So that might be worth checking out, uh, Rob. All right. Yep. All right. You know. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Silicon Valley Engineering Council was was mentioned in terms of that being here in Silicon Valley, kind of a melting pot of, of the large number of organizations, bringing them together under one umbrella. Um, you know, there, there's definitely potential potential there. Um, I think it's struggled with the pandemic and other issues also, but um, there's definitely potential there. There was something called IEEE bucks that some folks in the Orange County section were were using apparently locally, you know, uh, to try to recognize folks that volunteered and did different things. I'm not sure what you know how they actually use the bucks, but there's a concept they had. I always thought that was kind of a cool idea. So I could see making that, you know, a broader thing and also a way for more people engaging and just you know another way to make volunteering more interesting. I mean, I think there is in place a financial reward, this member get a member type thing, right? Yeah, if I there is for that. Somebody yeah. And they join, um, you know, that I get some little bounty for uh, bringing them in. Or even just getting badges. You know, if I, yeah. if I a volunteer, I get, you know, on my, uh, you know, that I get a badge somewhere that I can use, you know, that says, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, a black belt IEEE volunteer or something, you know. That's right. I triple <laughs> member with uh, distinction with multiple ribbons, multiple ribbons, ribbons right? yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These might be some uh, some good things to chase when you're president, Tom. Well, I've always, you know, looked at you know, that this stuff should be fun. We get into this because technology is interesting to us, and if we stay with each other, it's because we enjoy being with each other. Things that help us to get more enjoyment out of being part of IEEE and be part of this community, I think, uh, increase the value of that community to its members. Before we do close, um, 
people who attended this meeting, obviously these are people that have interest in these kinds of questions. Uh, if any of you would like to get some involvement in the Tom Coughlin campaign, uh, there are those of us that can uh, help to take advantage of your skills. We, we've had several discussions about uh, maybe how to get more uh, students involved, um, people that better understand social media than some of us fossils uh, understand it. So we, we want to start taking advantage of that. And we recognize that the big picture for the election uh, truly is a lot more than the United States. You know, it's, it's India, it's Asia. Uh, it's Europe. It's way yep. more than the U.S. And we need to be able to communicate with those groups better. Well, thank you, so Kevin. If you have those kind of skills, please get in touch. Or if you have other skills and you want to participate, please get in touch. So, Tom, back to you. Oh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, I hope that it's been, uh, it's been interesting to you and useful. And I'm glad for all the comments and questions that we've gotten here. Um, you know, we'll uh, we'll save all this stuff, and if I do get elected, I'll have to think, I'll have to see what I can actually do. <laughs> but it's um, uh, but I, I it's been a fascinating experience to uh, uh, to have uh, gotten here and to uh, be able to talk to folks. And at the very least, I hope that more people are going to end up voting in IEEE elections because yeah. they really can matter. I think. Right. I I, I would I would definitely amplify that. Um, the, the, the historically, the turnout for elections like this, even, even where there are multiple candidates are not particularly high, uh, Tom Coughlin can win just by turning out more votes, you know, just by increasing the participation, that can be enough to sway it right, right there, even if you don't sell uh, another candidate. I, so I guess that's a win in two ways, yeah. One, one, one last question I wanted to ask you that I forgot to bring up before, so you have been IEEE USA president before. Yes. How, how, how do you see this role, uh, IEEE president-elect, overall IEEE, how does that differ from IEEE USA and, and what you did as IEEE USA president? Well, it's, for one thing, it's global. Um, and it's, I think, uh, uh, more time consuming, you know, I think, uh, than being US president uh, was. Um, and. You know, I look upon myself as that, you know, it's, it's really, you know, like I was saying before, being a volunteer gives me an excuse to meet folks. I, I think it'd be fascinating the people that, you know, you could meet, you can maybe get engaged with IEEE, have that opportunity, you know, as, a, as in that role and, uh, you know, try to impact the future of the organization. And, and I think, you know, as we mentioned in the last town meeting, one of those things, we got to get more young people engaged with us. We yeah. got to get more young people to think that IEEE needs to be part of their career. Yeah, and it's important. Very, very and we very also, and part of that, yeah, and part of that's gonna be creating active sections. Part of that's gonna be greater relevance to industry. And part of it's gonna be, you know, being, you know, in emphasizing that engineering is an adventure. Engineering, we create new wealth, we create new opportunities, we create um, new ways in which people can uh, learn about the world around them and then apply that knowledge to help other to help other people and to help uh, mankind in general, you know. And you know we're going to be part of an interplanetary species, you know, <laughs> before too long with the way things are going. Like Branson just went into space, right? Um, and Bezos is going to go soon as well. So it ain't very long, you know. The, and, and it's because of engineering of various sorts, including electrical engineering. But and not everyone is a member of IEEE is electrical engineer. A lot of oh, that's great. Right. A great amount of them aren't, you know, Very true. but we are a group of people that can represent some of the best things about mankind that by means of understanding nature, we can leverage that knowledge to change the world, to make things better for other people and to uh, create new opportunities that never existed before. So, you know, I, that's a, that's some I of the differences I, I see, you know, bringing it up another notch, you know, in terms of that, of that. I, I, I know what you said about the International Group uh, Association with IEEE. I know you have historically traveled extensively internationally, and I think you have some international travel upcoming here. Uh, I do. Later yeah. this month, next month. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're going to be making some presentations and things while you're traveling, I believe. 
at very odd hours, yes. Very odd hours. Okay, maybe <laughs> recorded for later viewing. Uh, here. Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, I think uh, we can close. And again, appreciate everyone who attended. Some really good discussion tonight. And I, I think it um, shows, shows a lot of interest in these issues, certainly. So thank you. Thank you, folks. Appreciate you joining us today.